Okay, so how, how do the mo motor units produce tension? They do it by the, the pattern of action potentials. And so what's really qualitatively different between a slow twitch, uh, a slow motor unit and a fast motor unit is that the muscle fibers that are innervated produce either long changes in muscle tension or very short. In the case of slow twitch muscle fibers, the, the change can last for 100 milliseconds. The rise time can be 100 milliseconds. So this can be 100 milliseconds, this can last for a long time. Whereas this rise time can be on the order of five milliseconds. So it's much, much shorter. Um, and as a consequence, a, an action potential that, that uh, happens, say, 50 milliseconds later will still uh, affect this muscle when the fiber is already partially contracted. Okay, so it can summate. This is a summation of muscle tension. This can produce a summation of muscle tension. Whereas that same, a muscle, uh, an action potential way out here from an, after an initial one it is gonna occur way after this um, muscle tension has returned to baseline. And so it can't summate. It has to, it's a, you know, only in a much more restricted period of time that action potentials can occur and produce a summation of muscle tension. Now, before we, we go on and add some more action potentials to this uh, scenario, I want to mention one finding that is of common, uh, commonly appreciated. Uh, but it was, uh, it was a sort of a surprise when it was first, when it was first discovered. And that is, if, if, you, if you're recording, you're doing an experiment and you're recording from a muscle and you've never stimulated it, the first time you stimulate it, you don't get a nice robust response. You have to stimulate it a whole bunch and then, and then it is warmed up. So the warm up that you feel in your muscles that you do whenever you go out to move, when you go out to run around, when you go out to, to compete through racing or, or doing whatever you're doing, you're warming up muscles. That has a complete biological basis and it is observable um, experimentally. All right, so all of what I'm gonna show you, all of what I'm showing you is in warmed up muscles. This is already warmed up and we'll talk about what, what constitutes a warm up in a moment. All right, so all we're talking about is the fact that slow, slow muscle fibers produce a long lasting muscle tension so you can have firing uh, patterns that are, are slow and they will still summate. Whereas fast twitch muscle fibers produce fast, um, uh, short bursts of high tension and so widely separated action potentials will not summate. Now let's consider what ha would happen if we, instead of having two action potentials, we have a whole train of them, a whole series of them. And we're doing this experimentally, so we're gonna put them in at regular intervals. And this, so here we are, we're putting in an action potentials at regular intervals, and we're recording the muscle tension. And what you see is that every time there's an action potential, there is a increase in muscle tension. And then you reach, you reach, you start to plateau, but you can still see the effect of every action potential. So there's, you're, you're, you obviously are, are topping out, but there's still um, an effect of this action potential. It's producing a little blip. And this is called unfused tetanus, unfused tetanus. If you continue this train of action potentials a little bit longer, what you'll see is that the ability to see the effect of any single action potential on muscle tension disappears. And that is called fused tetanus, okay? Now let's consider what's the effect of missing one action potential. And what you see here is the effect of missing one action potential in this train. And what does it do? It takes you out of tetanus and it puts you back on this really slow rise back up to tetanus. So this is an, 
you wouldn't think it would have such a huge effect. It has a huge effect. Conversely, let's, what's the effect of adding in a spike? Well, the effect of adding in a spike is also disproportionately large. In this case, instead of taking this much time to reach uh, unfused tetanus, you reach unfused tetanus really quickly. And you reach tetanus about the time that you would normally reach unfused tetanus. What's the take-home message here? The take-home message is that the specific pattern of action potentials is really important. And what does that make you think of? Where, what type of disease, what type of, uh, of condition is going to disturb the timing of action potentials? Think about it, think about it. Demyelination, demyelination. Here you have a, 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 a the, this is an original message. It, if you, convert this to zeros and ones, it spells out in computer code, it spells out myelin. But if you just lose four spikes because of demyelination, um, then you, you get a totally different message. If, if all the, the, the spikes are just delayed by one uh, moment, one interval, then you also get a completely garbled message. So the point being that demyelination, any disruption that commonly produced by demyelination is going to completely disrupt the pattern of, of uh, the message that a muscle gets. And it's going to lead to the muscle doing things that it, it should not be doing, that were not intended. Um, because it's getting a garbled message, because the pattern of action potentials is so very, very important. And the last thing I'll just say is that that warm up that we need, the warm-up is a tetanus. We need tetanus to get warmed up, okay? So a warm-up, a tetanus warm-up of a muscle will then allow a, any future stimulus for hours to have a, uh, it, its maximum um, effect. In the next video, we're gonna look at orderly recruitment. <laughs>